Hi, and thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, where I've just finished building this cedar garden trellis slash obelisk project. Due to the complexity of building a project like this based on a triangular footprint rather than a rectangular one, I've broken the build process into three parts. The first part I'll show is milling the material for the slats and for the legs, and then making a scarf joint fixture for cutting the angle on the top of the legs where they mount to the finial. In part two of the video series, I'll show how to make a hexagonal blank for the finial by laminating pieces of two by six together. And then in this final segment of the series, part three, I'll show the fixtures I used for cutting the steep, sharp compound angles on the ends of the slats, doing the half lap joints, and then some of the assembly. So let's dive into this part of the series. To begin part three of this trellis build-out project, I want to talk about building and using the fixture that I used for cutting compound angles on the ends of the horizontal slats. Unfortunately, I didn't get good video shot when I was actually building the trellis, so I'm making this section up after the fact. So all I have to work with is a few scraps that are similar in size and shape to the actual slats on the trellis. But that shouldn't matter much because the setup and function of this fixture can be used for a wide range of applications. So the core of a fixture like this is a platen that slides on the table and it has a couple of hardwood guide bars that fit in the miter slot that keep everything steady for super accurate cuts. You probably recognize the handle. It's the same one I used for the scarf joint cutting fixture. I just unscrewed it from that jig and screwed it onto this one. The plywood itself was attached to the runners in the same method that I did on that scarf cutting fixture. I put the hardwood bars in the miter slots, bump the plywood up against the rip fence, and mark everything so that those hardwood runners get screwed accurately to the bottom of the piece of plywood. So with the guide bars and the platen and a handle for running the jig, the next step is to add these angled fences to the platen. This will be a little difficult to show, but with the trellis itself, it's built on an equilateral triangle. So there's three 120 degree pie pieces that make up the framework. So if the legs on the trellis were running straight up and down, then each of the horizontal slats would just have a 30 degree cut on each end. And that's a 30 degree included angle or a 60 degree angle set on a saw because the two complement each other. But you already knew that. So if that was the case, the legs were running straight up and down, I'd just have a simple cut to make. But because the legs are angled in at 10 degrees and the horizontal slats have to follow that slope, it actually turns out to be like 8.1 degrees that the slats are tilted in. But the bottom line is I need to have a cut that'll fit those legs at a 60 degree angle with an 8.2 degree tilt to them like this. And that changes the angle setting for the cut. As with other parts of this trellis, there would be a way to cut these pieces with a compound miter box by changing the fence and angle settings and everything. But I want to use a fixture for these because I want to be able to measure and see the exact length of these pieces because I've got three different lengths, the ones at the bottom, the ones at the middle, and the ones at the top. Each level of the horizontal slats is made of three pieces of the same length. So I want to be able to easily see and cut to a mark for those three different length slats. And this fixture solves all those problems and also is adaptable to a wide range of situations and has the capability of making cuts that wouldn't be possible on a compound miter box without a lot of difficulty. The issue with making a left and a right cut with that compound miter box, if you have to change the settings every time to cut one end and then the other end, and then be able to read to a mark, that would be overly complicated. But by now, this is sounding a little bit complicated too. So the key to making a fixture like this work is visualizing the angle it needs to be cut and making a setup so I can make repetitive cuts. Incidentally, I've used this very same sled with the fences set at 45 degrees for similar cuts, compound angle cuts, for the same reason. So the difference in this case is that these fences are set at 30 degrees off of a parallel line rather than at 45. From my SketchUp model and then measuring, I determined that the, the horizontal slats, they're not vertical, they're tilted in at a little over eight degrees. So for this particular setup, I started with a blank board, laid out a 30 degree line on the board, took just a scrap two by four, and ripped it with one face beveled at the tilt angle I'm looking for is like 8.2 degrees. 
and then using the miter box with a 45 degree fence setup which you'll see later in the video I cut this 30 degree sharp angle on here then it's a matter of placing the block with the beveled edge on the layout line so that the long point extends to a position where it'll be cut by the blade I did the same with another piece I cut this angle opposite and positioned it on a 30 degree line going the other direction so once everything's laid out and these angled fences are set up I just need to raise the blade to the point where it'll cut all the way through this two inch piece and like the scarf cutting fixture it's a lot of exposed blade on a fixture like this a guard really doesn't work but with the handle back here I'm able to keep my hands out of harm's way and still make very accurate cuts repetitively. When I'm making cuts like this, I'll always cut the difficult angle first. In effect, this side will be harder to see the mark than this side because I'm right-handed. So the procedure is the blanks are longer than they need to be. I cut one square end off with the left-hand angle, make a measurement, and cut the other end off with the right-hand angle. And that's how that fixture works. It produces very accurate, very crisp, sharp compound angle cuts. And it's very simple to mark the different lengths of slats that I need. When I'm cutting, I can dial in on that cut mark. If I was making dozens of these parts, I would probably incorporate a stop block here to repeat the cuts and not have to follow the pencil mark each time. I suspect that's clear as mud with me patching this video together long after the fact. But with the horizontal slats cut, I'm able to move on with making the compound angle cuts for the X's and the half lap joints. The compound miters on the ends of the decorative X bracing for the trellis were a challenge. Because of the way the X's intersect the legs, there's a different cut at the top of the slat versus the bottom. And they're a very steep, acute angle on both, indexing to the lower end and the upper end. If my only tool was a compound sliding miter box, I would figure out a way to make these cuts using that tool. But I opted to make a fixture for the table saw for making these cuts so that I have a repeatable indexing spot for cutting these to the proper length. While working through the video editing process, I decided to back up and create a little fill-in segment that goes into a little more detail about creating the fixture for cutting these compound angles. The fixture itself is made up of just three pieces of plywood screwed together and attached to the miter fence with a couple screws. The most important features of this fixture are that this face is perpendicular to the table and that the fixture is square so that when it's mounted to the miter fence which is running in the miter slot that this surface runs parallel to the blade. It's important that there's enough size that I can keep my hands back here out of the way of the blade when making the cut and that this face is big enough to clamp the X pieces onto. I always talk about how quick and easy it is to make a fixture like this out of scrap materials and one of the little things that I do to make it quick and easy while making it sturdy and accurate is to add a very shallow rabbit on the edges of pieces where the pieces come together. I'll take this apart quickly to show what I'm talking about. This back panel where it attached to the miter fence is put on with screws because I'm not concerned about hitting those screws with the blade. The bottom piece is attached to this side face piece with 2P10 adhesive because I didn't want to hit screws with the blade while making this angle cut. But the small rabbet really facilitates assembly with either screws or glue. The key to making this little rabbit, and it's only a sixteenth of an inch deep, is to set the blade height so that the top of the teeth are exactly flush with the thickness of the panel. I'm rocking the blade back and forth to watch that the arc of the blade is tangent to the top of this surface. That means that the depth of the cut will be the same thickness of this panel. Then I just set the fence so that the blade is taking a partial cut across the face of the material. 
a blade with a flat top grind on the teeth makes a little better notch, but you can get the job done with virtually any blade. The goal is to end up with a shallow rabbet, less than the thickness of the blade, so that when the shoulder of the rabbet rests on the thickness of the piece, the bottom side is flush. Once the blade is set up, I put the rabbet on two edges of the main clamping panel, and then one edge of the back panel where it screws to the miter box, so that the assembly with screws is quick, accurate, and easy. If you try to make a similar joint just on the face and try to get this screwed on, it's easy for this to just move around when the screw heads enter the different laminations or sometimes the sheet will swell when the screw gets put in. And this also makes it real simple to use CA adhesive with an activator to glue two pieces together. In that case, I spray activator on the rabbited side, put glue on the board, and with the panel up against the fence, can quickly and easily glue the two surfaces together. So I hope that shows how and why I prepare the pieces the way I do, and that you can see the advantage of having that small rabbit on there for indexing these pieces together. And one last note is that when I'm screwing the pieces together, I use a snappy bit of the right size to make these pilot holes especially in plywood because without that pilot hole, the screws tend to divert off between the laminations in the material. It tends to swell the material if the screw is forcing its way through and bumps in the edges kind of throw the fixture off a little bit. But with the rabbit and a pilot hole, these pieces click together nicely. Adding screws is a breeze. And the end result is a fixture that is sturdy, accurate, true, safe, and disposable. The guy with the DWF Crown channel on YouTube, I don't know his name right offhand, does a great job of explaining a simple way of cutting angles that are sharper than 45 degrees by attaching an auxiliary block to the fence and then subtracting from 45 degrees the number of degrees of angle between a 45 degree cut and the desired cut. Boy, I sure made that sound complicated. In this case, I'm shooting for 41.4 degrees. So by taking 3.6 degrees off of 45 and indexing off a 45 degree cut, I'll get the 41.4 degree angle that's needed for the bottom ends of these pieces. The top ends are just 31.6, I think, and they can just be set directly on the angle scale of the miter box. I have a couple holes drilled through the fence on my miter box for cases like this, just because I like the way screws hold better than clamps with this particular fence. But that's all a matter of personal preference and discretion. With a 45 degree face to index from, I simply take off the one, two, three point six degrees from 45. Quickly, cleanly, and safely make the cut to leave this 41.4 degree included angle. There's plenty of compound miter saws on the market today that'll cut well beyond 45 degrees and make the whole thing work out. But this process can be used even beyond the degree limits of the newest saws on the market today. And I'll try to remember to include a link to the DWF Crown tutorial that explains this method in a little more detail, at the same time showing a different application for this sort of cut. Even though I've got a bit of setup time for the cutting fixture, it'll save time in the long run and make cutting the pieces more accurate and consistent. And one of the reasons that it's a benefit is that with the fixture, I'll add the bevel indexing off the cut mark. That way, the long points of all these slats will be the same 
because the pieces they started off with were all the same length and same angle. So I've set the blade to the proper angle so that the miters intersect the faces of the legs. And that's like 30.4 degrees in this case. I want to be able to orient these pieces so that the cut edge lays flat on the table for the angle on either end of the piece, which changes. And because it's imperative that the long point of this miter ends up in the same spot every time, I'm just taking a sheet of quarter inch material here and putting a reference line. And then when I screw through the miter gauge into the fixture, the cut of the blade will be right on that line. So when it's time to cut the parts, I simply use this as a gauge, set the piece on it, clamp it, and make the cut. And that way the long point comes out exactly on the line and the pieces remain at the correct length. Perfecto Monday. As I said, there's a different angle on each end of the X pieces. I've got two angles to make, so I'm resting the cut flat on the gauge. And marking the pieces. I want to pick a spot that's common to both of the cuts that's low near the table for putting a supporting peg. And I'll have that common spot right here. And this supportive peg can be any number of things, but I happen to have this piece of solid plastic bushing material with a hole in it. And I'll use this screw to put it in place And having a sturdy peg here that won't get cut off by the blade, allows me to use just one clamp for each cut rather than having to clamp twice to keep the part from kicking into the blade as the cut is made and it loses the support of the piece on the surface. And that'll probably make a little more sense when you see this in use. Now I can do a test run. And I'm watching the cut sitting on the spacer piece as more important than the pencil lines. But in this case, the pencil lines are accurate. can see in the close-up shot, the long point of this board is precisely on top of the spacer board, giving a perfectly accurate compound angle, even with this radically sharp angled cut. As a side note, I found it really useful to whip up these dedicated use fixtures. I just use scrap materials and design it specifically for the function at hand. They need to be dead accurate and safe, but not the kind of thing that I think, oh, I've put so much time and effort into this that I'll save this jig in case I ever need it again because the chance that I'll need to make another part like this at any time in the future is pretty slim and I don't want to have a bunch of wonderful fixtures that I've designed and built laying around the shop cluttering things up if I hardly ever use them. Plus, if in a week or two I happen to need to make another part like this, the jig is so quick and simple to make, I'll just make another one, use it, and then disassemble it and put the scraps in the wood box. So with this particular dedicated fixture, all I need to do now is place the part firmly on the indexing board, 
clamp it securely at the top and make the cut. And there it is. From here, it's just rinse, leather, repeat until I have all 12 of the pieces for the X members cut. It's about time I showed up, huh? And if you'll notice that while we weren't looking, Chip ditched the hand clamp and instead added a destaple style clamp to the fixture to make the whole process a little more efficient, less clunky, and safer to use. Hard to find good help these days, but I think he's got it. I love my job. I almost spoiled a whole batch of parts, but I remembered at the last minute that the way the X's are laid out, they need to have a left and a right component to them, and the angles need to be mirror image. These are almost like cutting jack rafters for a hip roof. So I flipped the jig around, moved the clamp, and moved the support peg so that the pieces could be cut in this orientation instead of this orientation like I had it set up originally. It's an easy fix, and I caught it at just the right time, so I'm happy. That kind of makes your day, doesn't it? Yeah, awesome, Chip. I was thinking of that earlier, forgot all about it. I'm glad you caught that. He's a good guy to have around. And there it is. With all these parts cut the length and all the compound angles cut on there, they're ready for a half lap joint and then installation on the trellis. My weapon of choice for making half lap joints is a dado blade. And my dado blade of choice is a forest dado king. This is an awesome setup. I'll set it up at full width and then make multiple passes on these two inch wide half laps. A little pointer here, I took a piece of rubber roof membrane and made a washer out of it so that I can lay these two blades next to each other and the teeth won't hit each other and chip. And I can set that other outside blade aside while I add the chippers. I'm going to get grief for that. Putting it in backwards. Got to pay attention. The thing that makes this dado king blade unique is that the entire dado stack is ground and machined together with a serial number. So this set belongs with this set. And that's a good part of why it's so surgically accurate when put to use. And for dado blade use lesson 101, I'll just point out that it's important that the carbide teeth don't touch each other or touch the blade blank because that'll bend the blades and the chippers and chip the teeth. There needs to be clearance between the carbide lug and the blade blank so that one isn't deflected or influenced by the other. And then the chippers are spaced apart from each other so that the teeth don't line up and it makes for a smoother cut with an even feed rate. 
After setting the dado blade for the depth of this half lap joint and then turning the fence to the desired angle, which in this case is 10 degrees, all the half lap joints can be cut in the slats to end up with this configuration of this ornamental X on the trellis. Maybe I'd do better at this if I was a real cowboy, but this is the kind of project that can buck you off the horse. With the left and right angles and the way that these diagonal parts need to line up with the sharp, acute angles, this angle is not 90 degrees, it's 100 degrees to make the X's line up. All those little factors come together and got to keep your wits about you. I haven't ended up ruining any of these parts, but I've come close a couple times. And I guess I'm just saying this because no matter where you're at in your carpentry career, you can get bucked off a horse. So pay close attention to what you're doing and don't hesitate to make test setups and test cuts on scrap pieces before you charge in and make a bunch of really accurate mistakes, which I've been known to do a time or two. And once all the half lap joints are cut, it'll be a matter of placing the pieces together and attaching them to the trellis. With the half laps completed on these two sizes of asymmetrical X's, the final step is to locate the X's to center up on the intersection of these two slats and attach them to the trellis, and I'll call it a day. For locating these X's, I'll just mark the centers of the vertical and horizontal ribs with a little gauge block. And then position the X with a clamp and line up the joining marks with the center marks. And that nicely positions the X's with the same reveal on the sides of the legs and with the 100 degree orientation in this space, the points of these X's meet precisely like they do in the SketchUp model. I'm just adding a couple of exterior grade Perks head fasteners to secure the X's in the middle. And then I'll pilot hole and attach the ends of the X's with a snappy bit specifically designed for these Torx head trim screws. I won't make the statement that screws are necessary for something like this. It's the way I choose to build it. But using an air nailer would certainly be fine in a lot of applications. Now I just spin the trellis around, put the X's on the other two sides, and call it a day. So after I finished installing the X's on the trellis, I took it to a painter who partially disassembled it, painted it up nice, and stuck it in the garden. And it's a beautiful thing. So with all that, I guess this series is a wrap. And any viewers that have seen all three parts of the series will remember how it started out milling parts, some of the tricks for the planer, and then a scarf cutting fixture for cutting those long taper joints for the legs. Part two was making the finial, milling and laminating two by six lumber to create a hexagonal blank for the finials. And in this final part three, the two fixtures, the compound angle cutting fixture for the miter fence and then the compound angle cutting fixture for the table saw for the horizontal slats. So that's a fair amount of material to cover in that three-part series and I hope there's enough tips and tricks and methods in there that made it worth your while for watching. And as always, I put a link to the Next Level Carpentry Amazon Influencers page in the video description and those links are for a lot of the tools and supplies I use in the videos and any purchases made through those links help support Next Level Carpentry, and I really appreciate it. And I'm gonna to toss in an Easter egg here at the end of this three-part series for those dedicated viewers that have watched to the bitter end. And that Easter egg is the fact that I'll upload the trellis model that I referenced and used for planning and building this to the SketchUp component warehouse. If you're a SketchUp user, you can open up SketchUp, go to the component warehouse, and then just search the Triangle Trellis Obelisk Project 
and you'll find the model. You can download it and then you can use it as I did as a virtual plan for designing and building a trellis very much like the one that I've done in this video. So I hope you find that beneficial. If anybody goes there and downloads that, throw in a comment over there so that I can see that a connection was made between YouTube and SketchUp and I'd appreciate it. And for any viewers that might have come to this series at part three, I'll include a link right at the end at the top for part one of the series and then part two of the series. And so to viewers and subscribers, new and old, thanks for watching.